Hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthcare Planning, um, otherwise known as Advanced Care Planning. And today, our guest is Hillary Kerr from the Bronson Healthcare Group. Um, she is here because April 16th is National Healthcare Decisions Day. We are coming up on that pretty quick, aren't we, Hillary? Oh, yes, on um, Friday. <laughs> it's on Friday, exactly. So this is a great week for this. Um, my name is Amy Nichols. I'm the campus coordinator for the Campus for Creative Aging, which is a division of Region 4 Area Agency on Aging. The Campus for Creative Aging is a really cool physical space designed to make aging fun and creative and educational and all that great stuff, except for the fact that COVID has closed our front doors. So we had to pivot a little um, and we have now learned to do everything via Zoom. So I'm very happy we have a, a nice group for this today to get, be in our Zoom and this will be recorded it is recorded right now and if you um, have any um, any qualms about being on camera you can turn your camera off or i can turn it off for you or if you're having a bad hair day like i am i'm struggling here i um <laughs> i would love to turn mine off but as the host they don't let you do that so um, with this will be um, on our youtube channel and probably maybe pushed out on facebook as well before we're done so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce you to Hillary and turn this over to Hillary Kerr, who also has a special place in our hearts because she has worked for Area Agency on Aging before. So it's all you, Hillary. Well, when you're getting the PowerPoint set up, I'll introduce myself just a minute here. So um, I have a master's degree in gerontology. And most of my life experience is certainly not with any of the degrees, it's with the jobs and the things I've done. So I've been a social worker in nursing homes. I've been a public guardian. I was at the Area Agency on Aging and I worked with um, the same role that Ms. Dell does. She works with the MAP, uh, Medicare uh, counselors. And I also helped on the phone lines with the um, answering the aging calls. Presently, I'm with Brownson. And I also teach classes at Western. I live in Waterloo, um, so I am enjoying the beautiful spring sunshine today before we get the cold Michigan weather. So you could pop up the PowerPoint. We'll just jump right in. I'm going to present. Can you all see probably, this now? Yeah. Everybody I'm going to present it. probably for about 30 minutes and just kind of hold your questions. And then we can have a good discussion after. And I like the size of this group. Having um, about 10 people is perfect. So we can have a really great conversation around um, the topics. So again, our topic is healthcare planning and I'm representing both Bronson and Western. Oh, Amy, it's not letting me flip to a new one. Okay, uh, Len, you're just gonna say, I've, it's because I'm screen sharing at the moment. Okay, so, so, so I'll just like say to, next. Just tell me next, unless you wanna run it. It's up to, unless you want to, uh... Just tell me next, it's probably easier. Okay, next. Okay, hold on, let me get over to this side. Now my clicker is on the wrong side. There we go. So this is a little bit of context. When most people think about planning, they think about the financial and they think about, oh, where's my house or my car or the money in my bank account going to go? And people sometimes do a will or a trust or they will sometimes do a document that says, well, uh, if I'm really ill and I can't sign my checks and take care of my bills, this is who I trust to take care of my money for me, just if I can't do it. And that's called a financial durable power of attorney. That's all the middle section and that's financial planning. Um, and then some people think about, okay, when I do die, what do I want to happen to me? And that's after death planning. And you can think about, um, how you want your funeral to look, whether you want a burial, cremation, whether you want to donate to your, your body, your, um, what, do you, what do you want done? And those are important conversations and important things to write down um, to share with loved ones. But today I'm going to talk about a type of planning that only about 30 to 40 percent of Americans think about, and it's healthcare planning. And I would argue it is more important than the other two, to be honest, because this is planning. I'm gonna plan for what happens to me, my health and my decisions if I become ill. So that's what, what healthcare planning is all about. It's a separate distinct type of planning. 
Um, the other ones are, are important as well. Um, so if you could go on to next, please, Amy. And we've all learned life is not one easy, nice little straight path. And lots of things can happen unexpectedly. Um, and that's true with health too. So something can happen. I can have a sudden car accident. I had a 32 year old um, sister-in-law who had a brain aneurysm. She certainly didn't expect that. And she was, she recovered, um, but she had some serious surgery and she was in ICU and her mom was making her medical decisions for a time. Um, those things we, didn't, we can't anticipate when illness happens. Other times it's a chronic illness. So maybe I have um, something for years, but in time it ends up uh, making my mental status where I can't make my own decisions. So really good to make these decisions while we're well, and we are kind of can calmly think about it and talk about it before that crisis. Because with, when we're in a crisis, we are just not in the same frame of mind. Next, please. So there are three key topics that we're gonna to talk to today. One is going to be uh, learning how to choose and to prepare a patient advocate. And a patient advocate is the person that we name we can trust to make decisions like we would. The second thing we're gonna review is uh, a little bit about the advanced directive, and that's the legal document that we put our choices on. And the third one is, how do we even begin to talk about how we see quality of life, how we wanna live until we die, basically. And you may all be starting to get this like rock in your stomach, like, oh, this is kind of heavy topics. This is a little uncomfortable. And it is, because essentially we're talking about um, if disease, death, disability, accident happens, and it's hard to think about. Um, but we want to push through that feeling of an uncomfortableness because this is for us, about us, and to make sure our choices get adhered to because no one can honor our wishes if we never share them, if we keep them inside. Next, please. Um, Amy sent you, I believe in the mail, um, two separate documents. One is a booklet, the Medical Wishes Care Planning Booklet that has the little tree on it. And that takes you through every step that we're gonna go through with the slides today. And at the very back page, there's a quality of life survey. And then um, the actual document, the advanced directive document, that's a seven page document. Um, if you don't have them, I would be happy to send them and we can arrange that as well. Meg Next. was on vacation last week. So I don't think you all have gotten these yet. Um, okay. I couldn't put them out to her to send to you to timely get them. So you will get them very soon though from Meg. Don't worry about it, Hillary, I got them. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Next, please. Oops, too much. One too many. Um, these are the four steps to advanced care planning. This is not something I necessarily can say, you know, today is Sunday, I'm gonna get this all done by five o'clock. It's a process and it's something that it takes time to think about emotionally and mentally process and get things done. There are four key steps um, and we're gonna go through them uh, each with by separate slides. I need to make some key decisions. I need to put my ideas and my wishes formally down on that advanced directive legal document. I need to sit down and talk with family and share with what my feelings are. And then I need to make sure that important document is put in safe places so it can be found if there's ever an emergency. Next. So the first one is to decide on who would be a good patient advocate. So I wanna take a second and I want you just to kind of mentally think of two or three people that you think would be good choices to make medical decisions for you. And I'll just have a moment of silence so you can just kind of think about that. And then I'm gonna give you a job description for them. Okay, now that you have some ideas in your mind of who might be a good 
someone that would work well to make healthcare decisions for you. Now I'm gonna kind of give you some personality traits that work well. It has to be someone who is um, very strong and willing to talk with you about what your healthcare choices are, willing to learn what this new role is and step up if they ever asked. Someone who can talk to doctors and nurses, ask questions, um, deal with family who may not be happy. Um, someone who can challenge people and someone who can basically say, you know, doc, uh, let's look, look at this test or tell me what this test means. Someone who can be fairly aggressive, actually, I'll use that term. Um, so I have five siblings and if I were to choose for my siblings, I can't necessarily say, well, my older brother would be better. If I would look at personalities, my baby brother would be better um, based on this description. So you really have to look at the, the, who the person is and uh, your relationship with them. And if they would do this and one of their biggest jobs, if they ever have to make decisions for you is are they able to follow your decision? even if they disagree. Now we're gonna talk about that a little bit more because this is basically pertaining to the end of life things. So, and my brother actually has been, my baby brother actually has been on event two times. And if I was his patient advocate and he said, no, I never wanna be on a ventilator long-term. If I'm recovering, that's okay. And he was in both of these instances after a severe accident. But if he tells me, nope, I never want to be in a ventilator long-term, it's not quality of life to me. And I say, oh, I don't think I could do that. I may not be the best patient advocate for him. So this is a really important point. So I'll ask you to go back to those two or three people you were thinking about. And you may want to rearrange them based on personalities because it's not always about oldest child or spouse. Um, it doesn't have to be a family member. It can also be a friend or anyone else that you trust. Sometimes spouses are not always the best choices because spouses are so close that they may not be able to make those difficult choices. So sometimes they may choose maybe my sister or a best friend. Maybe they're, maybe they're able to follow through with my decisions. The other important point to know that so I have three children. So I can't say, well, I would like Job and Serena and Winter to make decisions together and they're all gonna be together making this. You have to have a team captain. You have to have a primary person and then some alternate individuals. And you actually definitely prefer you to list two and it's best to list three. So next, please. Oh, go back up. I think we missed one. Oh, did we? Yeah. Oh, no, we did not. No. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I, this one was shocking to me when I was previewing it, though, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And this is our second choice. For, so our first choice is basically, what, um, who do I want to choose as my patient advocates? And that you basically end up listing them, my primary, secondary, and third. The next big choice on any of these advanced directive or sometimes called durable power of attorney for healthcare forms is what are my goals of care? What types of life-sustaining treatments would I want or not want? And in a minute, we're gonna to go to how there's many different types of forms, but they ask the question in different ways. Um, they basically ask two questions. One of the questions is, um, and I'll actually I'll pull my brother in here for an example. So one of the questions is, if I am extremely ill and I'm not expected to recover, I'm not expected to come out to be who I was either physically or mentally, and my body's failing, do I want aggressive life supports to try to keep me alive? And the, the choices are, yes, do everything and anything to keep me alive. That's very important. Try, try as long as you can, but if it's not making me better or causing me pain, stop. 
stop whatever that is. And then the third choice is no, don't do express, uh, extensive measures on me. Let me um, be in comfort. So when you say no, it does not mean that you're saying I'm gonna die in pain alone. Sometimes people think that. Um, this is let me die comfortably and medications and, and measures are always taken to keep people comfortable. The second question that is asked is, do you want CPR? It seems like a fairly simple question. And we often go to what we see on TV. On TV, whether it's uh, either day or nighttime TV, a lot of times CPR is successful probably around 75 to 80% of the time. They show someone collapsing, someone doing CPR, they cough, sit back up and the meeting continues. <laughs> um, reality is much different. So I'm gonna share some, probably some startling statistics like Amy mentioned, but I do that to inform people. Before you make a choice, you need to know all the aspects of that choice um, to make an informed choice. So my age and situation matter. So if we think about this, and I have my 95-year-old grandma, I have my 75-year-old mom, I have myself at age 47, and I have my 19-year-old son, and we all have the same cardiac event. We're not all going to survive at the same. So our age and our health condition make a difference. So my son is probably going to fare the best, and us other three ladies are probably going to have a whole lot more troubles. Um, it also matters not only your age and health status, but it also matters where you are. And I'll include a story as well. So about five years ago, when my son was in a cross country meet, we were in the great fields of Goebbels um, and the individual who starts the gun, he collapses. And so some people standing by came by and they started CPR. Ambulance came by a few moments later um, and he was whisked off to the hospital. That would be considered a community event. He collapsed or had that emergency medical event in the community. Only half of those are witnessed. So what if he would have been at home? What if he would have been in his backyard? He may not, that event may not have even been witnessed and for him to get that medical care. So if a, if a lapse happens in the community, a person only has a 12% chance of surviving CPR. It's a lot lower than people think about. And it only raises to about 25% if you're directly in the hospital. So let's say my mom was in the hospital for a foot surgery and she had had a major medical event. Right then and there within minutes, a crash cart's coming, there's, there's five to eight medical staff right there and all giving her attention. She still only has a 25% chance of surviving. So again, these are a little scary to think about, but I actually research these every year from the American Heart Association. Oh, I believe your numbers. It was just surprising to me when I saw them, like 25% if you're already in the hospital is really yeah. surprising. Um, and then if I, let's say you go back to my grandma. So let's say my grandma has um, diabetes, heart disease, um, and arthritis, so multiple chronic illnesses, and maybe she has some late dementia. Um, anyone who has chronic illnesses and increased age, this percent decreases even further. It's literally between one and 5% of chance of surviving. Um, body just doesn't recover. Ribs that are going to be broken. They actually, um, if you've ever seen CPR, it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, you can hear the ribs cracking because they have to compress two inches down on your heart. The other thing that's not always understood about CPR is CPR and ventilation go together. So that gentleman in the field, um, when the EMS came, so initially someone was pumping in his heart, but when those EMS workers came, a tube went down his throat and they were initially giving him air this way, but CPR and ventilator go together when you're in that emergency. 
and you're almost all, always, if you survive, you're in the ICU on a ventilator. So that's not always, people don't always know what that process looks like. There are certainly success stories too of people who um, CPR saved their life and they've come, come through that event as well. Um, the other important fact to know is of those who survive CPR, half of those individuals are not the same person either mentally or physically that they were. CPR or ventilation is never gonna take away your initial illness. Um, it's, it's not a magic cure. So next slide, please. And there, I know there'll likely be questions on this. This is what I was talking about a minute ago about the overall choices, whether you, if there's a medical certainty that you will not recover. So my brother had a ventilator on after his motorcycle accident and he had some significant surgery and we were basically certainly had the ventilation ventilator on. And there was a circumstance where it was helping him heal while his body recovered from that trauma. He was healing, he was getting better and that ventilator was removed. This is actually talking about the situation where someone has had that uh, significant event. They received CPR and a ventilator. Now they're in the ICU and their body's not getting better. They are not improving, but their body's actually shutting down. And you're asked again to make yes, everything, try, but stop. And then no, don't do that or take them out if they have been inserted. Next slide, please. And this is where that uncomfortable feeling starts turning into a whole bowl of rocks in your stomach because this is heavy, uncomfortable, serious stuff when we start talking about our own mortality. And we really have to face this elephant in the room. And um, next slide, please. Yeah, the, the, the big elephant now is COVID. And actually I made this PowerPoint deck several months ago and now we're in this another resurgence. So we all do in the back of our mind, think about, oh boy, what if that was me? Um, so it just goes to show that we don't know when a significant life event can happen. We hope we never have to use any of these decisions or conversations, but what if? If I never share my feelings, people are going to not know what to do. And it's, it's just important to think about these things and really think about what if it was my time to die? It, it's hard to think about because um, we don't like to think about mental or physical capacity, dying, disability or disease. Um, so next slide, please. And this is what commonly people do when they start getting those feelings like, oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't like this. And we don't, we basically withdraw from the process and uh, just continue with life and kind of don't think about it. Next slide, please. Next again. There we go. So how do we even begin to mentally process how we would want those choices to look at for ourselves. There's a couple different things. The first thing is when we're thinking about, oh gosh, which one of those statistics would I fall under? Um, you actually can go to your doctor and have a conversation about this. And it is covered under Medicare. Actually, I believe it's kind of covered under Medicaid. Um, but Medicare has a certain billing code for it. So you can call up your doctor and say, you know, I'd like to make an appointment to talk about um, some goals of care. Um, and they're gonna give you a little extra time. They'll probably give you a 30 minute appointment. And you can ask the doctor and you can get a more individualized, it's called a functional health. Give me a big picture of what my whole health is and what would, what would some of these life-sustaining treatments look like for me? They differ. So, if I use myself, I have a couple chronic illnesses, but I'm fairly healthy. So I probably would be um, in that higher range of like the 25, 12. 
uh, percent of, of surviving CPR. Um, however, my dad, who had a very aggressive cancer, when he was in his 60s, he would have said, yes, try, do everything. I'm healthy. Um, I still want to live. As his cancer was progressing, we had multiple conversation as his health changed. The doctor had some conversations with him and said, okay, now that the cancer has done this to your body, and this is what we anticipate the disease to do, now they had a specific context to have that conversation. And they could say, now the CPR or aggressive treatments would look like this for you. So circumstances change this too. Um, the other thing not to fear is this is not a lifetime decision. So if I do this form today and I complete and I say, well, try, I certainly want to try and I, I want CPR and I want whatever measures. Um, but let's say it's 15 years down the road and, and life has changed or my physical health has changed. You can update this, have conversations with family and have that at any time and change your mind. If there's two forms on file, we're always gonna go with the one that's most recent. So when I'm thinking about how I even start even answering those yes, try, no, or having conversations with my loved ones who might be making decisions, how do I, how do I even begin to talk about that? There's a couple of tools that I have in the little booklet with the tree on it. One is this quality of life assessment where you're asked to, there's about 15 or 20 different things and you're asked to indicate, is this really important? Eh, not so much important to me. And that's something you can add with your document. When you're actually talking with your loved ones or thinking about this, it's a way you can think about it and saying, what's an acceptable way for me to live? And this is not acceptable way for me to live. When I was talking to my spouse about this, he said, you know, if I had a major medical event and I was on a ventilator and, and, and all these machines to keep me alive, if I had to have permanent care and someone had to, his term was, I someone had to wipe my butt and take care of me and I had to be in a wheelchair, um, that's not quality of life to me. I wouldn't want that. Now, a little crudely stated when he said that, but he gave me some valuable information. For him, being independent and being able to care for himself is important. He told me that in how he phrased that. So it's good to know if I ever have to make a decision for him. Now, I also told him, I said, you know, honey, you may not have a choice. I said, maybe you'll someday have a massive stroke. The whole left side of your body is not working. You're gonna have to have care anyways. So um, he kind of, looked, kind of looked at me funny after that, but, um, and we don't, we, we don't know where life will roll someday. Next slide, please. So we've gotten through the two decisions. Who's going to be my patient advocate? And how do I even begin to think about um, what my life sustaining wishes would be. The next thing is now that we've thought about it and people process different, like I said, they sometimes will go to the doctor and ask questions. Sometimes people will journal about it or pray about it or ask their friends and family or do some research. I'm a researcher. I would be on the computer looking up information, but everyone process personal decisions their own way. Once I've got some decisions in order, then I'm going to want to pull out an advanced directive form. They are free to do. I do not have to go to an expensive lawyer. And I've, um, Area Agency on Aging is going to send you that form. And it's seven pages long. And it's called an advanced directive. Some people call it a DPOA for healthcare and lawyers will call it a patient advocate designation. So sometimes people get confused because there's so many types of forms and so many words to describe them. They essentially all do the same thing. The other important thing to know is just because I named my husband as my first decision maker does not mean he makes my decisions right now. 
Sometimes people are afraid that they're giving their power of decisions away right now. It is only if two doctors someday sign and say, Hillary cannot communicate, she can't rationalize, she can't understand, and she needs help making her medical decisions. Two doctors have to sign and they add that to this form. And then they ask my husband, do you want to be her patient advocate? He may say, no, I don't want to right now. Then they're gonna go down to that second person and they're gonna ask my sister, do you want to be her patient advocate? And she'll say yes. And then maybe she'll be making my medical decisions from there. And hope that I never get to those rocky waters or I never have health issues. I hope this never gets used, but what if? So Hillary, can, can we clarify yes. that the doctor signatures are only, are they needing to be done before an event or are they done during a healthcare event crisis? situation during or after okay um, so you. let's say i have a major car accident next week and i'm sitting in the icu and um i've had major surgery in the ice and i'm sleeping in the icu um, i can't make my medical decisions they're going to have a couple docs say nope she can't do it and then they'll turn to my family gotcha so we don't have to do that ahead i don't have to track down my family doctor was what i was worried oh, about goodness, no. so, okay well. thank you mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Now, these are some of the more common advanced directives that are out there. So there are the ones that the lawyers draft up that we can see on the left. And they're fairly lengthy. And in my opinion, a little, not a little, a lot hard to understand. I can read these through and not know what I read. Um, there's booklets called Five Wishes. They're, they're a very good document. You're gonna be sent out the Making Choices Michigan Advanced Directive document. I like this one and I've chosen it for Bronson. Um, Lakeland Spectrum uses the same type of document. And uh, I like it because it's easy to read, easy to understand and easy to under fill out. It's not too wordy for me. But there's also, um, if anyone's a veteran or has family that's veteran, the VA has a very good document. And at senior expos, you will often see these peace of mind books. They have a version in there as well. That's a good one to pick up because it actually has a component where you actually can identify your financial. Remember we had those different types of planning. There's some financial planning areas in there too. So that's a very helpful book. But these are all different forms of the advanced directive form that give you a venue to legally write down your healthcare wishes down. Again, 100% free. Next slide, please. So now that we've made our decisions, we've completed the document, and on the document itself, there's a couple areas that people may have questions. The first one is on page, this is all described in the book, but on page three, you're asked to signed in front of two witnesses and the witnesses cannot be family. They cannot be healthcare workers and they can't be someone who can inherit things in your will, basically inherit your money. So basically what you wanna do is you wanna to go to the bank or to the local coffee shop or any find some neighbors and just say, can you just witness my signature? And all they're doing is saying that you're you your, your sound mind and known as pushing you to do this form. Later in the document, your patient advocates, those people you chose to be possible medical decision makers actually have to sign. That can be at a different date. And so maybe I, I go to Starbucks and I get two witnesses and my form is partially complete. Now I'm going to go home and have my husband sign. Maybe I'll send it to my sister. And then the next week I'll send it to my son and get all those other signatures. Those can be on any dates. Um, after completing the document, this is actually the most important step is now that I've thought about and I've done a piece of paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that my loved ones really know what I would want because I really only have yes, try no, 
really broad, open decisions on this form. So I need to share more with my family of what, what I would want. Where do I draw my line in the sand of this is acceptable? This is not acceptable for me. And so in that tool you'll be sent to, there's a list of questions and it's things like, what's important to me? What things could I not live without? Um, like my husband was talking about being, being in a, being fully cared for by others 24 hours a day and needing, not being independent is important to him. Um, and so you don't have to answer all these questions, but they're a guide of how we start this conversation. This is not a conversation I want, want to have over Thanksgiving dinner with all six of my siblings and their spouses and kids around. So I want to set this up to be successful. I maybe want to call my sister up and say, you know, I'm doing these forms and I'd like to be my patient advocate. Can we sit down and talk for about an hour, about an hour next Sunday um, and have some tea or lunch? Um, it gives her a little warning what we're going to talk about. And then we can have a dynamic conversation. Everyone's not very comfortable talking about disease, disability, or dying. So sometimes, um, especially adult children will say, oh, mom, I don't like this. Um, let's talk about baseball. Um, they'll avoid the subject because it scares them. It's scary to think about their loved one dying. But you kind of have to push through that and say, you know, this is really important to me. And I want it's a gift I want to give you. I want to give you the gift of my decisions. Because someday you may have to make these decisions. And I want you to know what they are and not feel guilty or not feel bad about what those choices are. So it's really important to reframe that if, if you get that reaction. And here are some ways that you can open up that conversation. Something that talking about what you're worried about or a loved one that you knew, um, something happened. And right now we can say, you know, I'm really afraid um, in, in the news, I'm, I'm listening to all these people die of, of COVID and I want to think about these decisions. If I don't want anything to happen, but if something should ever happen to me. Next slide. So once, now that's the third step is to have that crucial conversation. Now we're almost there. Now I need to make sure that this form could be found. So no one expected my 32 year old brother to have that motorcycle accident in Chicago. It was a very scary Friday night at midnight when we got that call from a chaplain. So there are ways that you wanna make sure this form is out there and it can be found because when he was in having his surgery, he couldn't say, hey, that form's in my uh, filing cabinet and it's under this file in the back. Um, so you wanna make sure it's scanned in your medical record at your local doctor's hospital. So many of you may be um, Spectrum Lakeland. So you just basically take that form to your doctor's office they're gonna scan it in the medical record and it's gonna be available throughout the entire system. So maybe I'm at um, a different hospital or doctor, they still can find that in your record. I think by far the most efficient way is to email it. So you scan that document and you put attach it in the email, then you send it to your friends and family. And you say, very important, please save. That way, everyone has that on their phone. And when my sister and I, my sister lives in Pawpaw, she drove here to Waterfleet and we went to Chicago. We were emotionally and mentally a wreck. We didn't think about going to the safe for papers, but we certainly had our cell phones on us. We grabbed our purses and a coat and we were gone. So when they asked us, hey, does he have any forms? We could have looked through our emails via our phone. I think that's the best way. You want to give paper copies to your patient advocates. Most often where you are, your car is, so it's, it's important to tuck one in your car. And there's also something called a file of life. They're distributed sometimes at senior expos too, but you actually just can have a red folder and you can just put on black marker file of life and put that on your fridge. So if EMS is ever called, they can look in there they can see who your decision maker is. And it's also a good idea to have a list of your current medications, diagnoses, and allergies on there. 
That way it's a, a kit that someone can grab and, and take a look at and say, oh, they're allergic to this, I don't give them that. So it's a very good um, emergency preparedness technique. And then certainly you wanna put them in any drawer or safe where you keep your important papers. Next slide. Life changes. Um, who I was in my 20s, who I am in my 40s, and who I will be in my 60s and 70s will certainly be different. And who my support system is and what my feelings on my healthcare likely are all going to be night and day as I progress through the various chapters of life. So I wanna make sure that I look at this document periodically. Um, and I wanna look at maybe I get a divorce. I certainly don't want my husband as my decision maker anymore. I wanted to update that and change it. Maybe I get a new diagnosis and I wanna think about my choices in a different way. So just know that you wanna take a look at this. It's not a one and done and you can always change your mind as life changes. But you still always want to update those conversations. I have an uncle who is 91 and every family reunion, we missed last summer, but every family reunion, he knows in the evening, I will have two glasses of wine in my hand and I'll kind of nudge him over to the gazebo. And I can literally see the 90 year old man kind of roll his eyes, but <laughs> he follows me. Um, it's kind of funny when you get the role reversal, um, but he follows me and we, we sit under the gazebo and I've got a notebook and I ask him some of those questions because I'm his patient advocate. And I'll always start out and say, you know, this year, I understand that you were in the hospital once with your AFib and, and we'll go through a little bit. And then I'll say, okay, I just want to renew some of these questions again. So I understand if I'm ever asked to make your decisions, how you feel now. It takes a little bit to, to, for him to warm up. And I'm kind of leading this because I know about this stuff, but usually it would be the person leading it. Um, but even if, let's say you want to, you want to know, you want to take this to your friends and family. And let's say you want to say, Hey, you know, mom, I just went to this great presentation and I don't know what your healthcare choices would be. Let's talk about this. So distributing some of these documents to friends and loved ones is important too, because what if something happened to your mom? Would you know what her life sustaining wishes are? Has she wrote down who she wants to make medical decisions? So very hard, but very important conversations to have. Um, and again, I would still argue probably one of the more important types of planning because I'm planning about what happens to me and my body, not my inanimate stuff. It's me, what happens to me. So next slide, please. So again, the same line of thinking is now that you know about this, and some of you may have some documents, if you have done a document, I'd highly encourage you to look at that document that you did in the past and look and see if it's still what you want. If it is, actually it's something you can do as you go on the back and you can say, um, April 14th, I reviewed this document and it still continues to be my wishes and sign it. No witnesses, just it's basically a way of acknowledging that you, this is still what you want. If you haven't done a document, I would very much encourage you to do it, even though it is very hard and uncomfortable to think about and do. And I will actually challenge you because if you don't do a document, this is what happens. No one knows what you want and everything is done. So if I don't have an advanced directive and I happen to be at work next week and I collapse and they, they have no idea, there's nothing on record what I want, everything is going to be done. And then, then we'll be, the staff will be looking to my family and say, well, we don't have anything in writing. What, what would she want in this case? If I never talked to family, they would say, oh, I don't know. This is hard. That's what happens if you don't do this. And Worst case scenario is if, if I happen to be in a very severe state and I can probably never make decisions again, what they're gonna do is say, you know, she needs a legal decision maker. Now you need to go to court and get a guardian. So, um, which is a pretty long process, can be a long process. So it's very, very important because people who have done this are more than likely to have their decisions understood 
by their loved ones and more likely to have their decisions followed through. So next slide, please. Please, please pass it on. Um, you're gonna have my phone number. It's on the top of the slide. If you have any questions, please call me. We can talk through things. Normally I'd, I'd say hey, we can meet somewhere for a cup of coffee, but we can't do that right now. But call and we can talk through things or we can have an individual Zoom meeting. Um, share this with your loved ones. Again, think about mom and dad and siblings and children. I have a 18 and 21 year old children. What if something happened to them? All adults should have these. Next slide, please. So again, we, we talked about the type of planning on the extreme left of healthcare planning, but I would certainly encourage you to think about and do some of these other types of planning. Um, and again, of that peace of mind book, there is some documents regarding financial planning that you don't necessarily have to go to an expensive lawyer. Um, thinking about and talking about what you'd want after death and sharing that with your loved ones. If they don't, you never talk about it, they're not gonna know. And there's something called a personal legacy. So my dad knew he had cancer and we live our entire lives and we are certainly not about our stuff. But after death, we often get distributed a financial sum after someone dies. But that's not the important thing. The important part is what did they teach us? Who were they? What was our relationship? What important things did they do in life? So people sometimes leave a personal legacy. My dad left us and my, and my mom gave us, to, from, gave us these CDs for Christmas a year after he died. So we received three CDs and in there, they were each about an hour and a half long. And he talked about his life. He talked about us. He talked about his memories, Aww. the most precious thing. My mom likes to write. So my mom is alive and she's 73. She actually gave us this little book about my memories. And so she talks about her, her growing up and her life lessons. And so each of us six children have one of these precious individualized books. That's the most precious things I own. Those are awesome. Um, some people, it might be a recipe book. They're picture books. Um, it, your legacy is whatever you, it may be your art. Maybe you do quilts. Maybe you make a quilt for people. So thinking even about writing down a list and saying, I want my recipe books to go to so-and-so. I want my quilts to go to so-and-so um, or creating a project like my parents did. All these types of planning are good to do. And then you want to stick it into one physical file like you see in the right hand of the screen or you wanna put it on an electronic device. That way, if something happens, all my decisions and thoughts and important papers are in all one spot. This is a month to two month process. Maybe something good to think about this spring as we're kind of likely once again, being asked to stay home quite a bit. Um, just pretty big challenge to think about, but good things to do. And it is a precious, precious gift to your family to have this all organized. Um, otherwise you're left with a mess and a lot of questions if someone is very ill or dies. Um, next slide. And it is all about autonomy and choice. Um, so by doing this tough work now, you make sure that your wishes are followed through. Next slide. Got some additional resources. Um, there's a link there for other states. So my uncle lives in Arizona. So he has an Arizona document. Um, so there's a couple of fun links there about starting those legacies of how you even begin to do that. Uh, and about creating a legacy drawer, how you even, what you put in there and, and some ways to do that. Next slide. So um, actually, Amy, if you could open us up so I could see everybody, because I can only I see- I would love to. Here. There we go. And let's just open up for general questions. Um, <clears throat> I know I went through a lot of topics. And I see Jacqueline's taking notes. That's I do. I'm a note taker. <laughs> she is. Don't forget to unmute, ladies, and you can ask whatever you want.
Jerry, Jerry? you have a question? No? And again, my phone number is on the is phone and email is on that first slide. So again, feel free to call me. Sometimes I'm in and out of the office presently, so it does take a day or so to get back to you, but I would love to have a conversation um, and help in any way. It's let me ask, let's, since I can see everyone, let me ask a question. Who has done their advanced directive presently? Oh, okay. So looks like some of us probably need to renew ours and uh, maybe some of us need to think about doing ours. And again, highly, highly encourage asking. Actually, Easter is a good time to do it is, is asking parents and, and siblings and loved ones. I'm thinking about this. Is this something you have done? Um, the only, I, I'm, I'm dealing with something today, so it's kind of hard for me to talk about this, but uh, the only comment that I have is I've been put in the position of having to make a decision for my dad. And I've also been going through cancer and I didn't want my husband being stuck with certain decisions to make in case something went wrong. Mm -hmm. So I did make out a thing to let them know what I want done. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't be stuck with that. And so you're likely in where my dad was, as my dad went through several stages of his cancer, whether you're at the beginnings or wherever you may be, you also can make a little note and add it to your papers. So what may have happened a year ago and what you're feeling or going through now may be very different. And so there's no, too much information, it can't, is not a thing. So you actually can just write a little note, staple it to your important papers, making sure that's with it as, as, um, as you're feeling different things or as you choose different things based on your changing health. Right. If it is changing. Yeah. Linda? I have a you have a yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to ask her, you know, how do we get like your other people in your family to do this? Um, oh, that's a great question. Because I have like, I don't went to two deaths already since New Year's and I oh. got two of the siblings is dying. Um, and they, and we just struggle. They don't have nothing in plan. And then they don't go to the doctor. And then all of a sudden we struggling trying to bury them. And if we don't know what to do, and it just, I'm just tired. I'm just mentally and emotionally drained right now. Um, Cause we fight, I'm fighting now with my brother trying to figure out what he, what he wants to do and he just, I don't want to talk about it. So I'm just saying, what can you do to get them to come to this and re realization that need to be done and talked about? Um, that is very, very tough because you will have people who dig their toes in the sand and refuse. A um, couple of things you can do is one thing is take it in small bites so they're not overwhelmed. So, and sometimes kind of sneakily putting it in conversation. So instead of just kind of uh, being say, okay, what are your choices about this? Sometimes saying, hey, I watched a movie about this. What do you think about this? And then maybe kind of edging the conversation that way. Or, you know, gosh, I just went to a funeral and I'm really worried about, you know, the family was all fighting about, you know, Mrs. Smith's burial. And I don't want that to happen to us. You know, but I want to share what my choices are. What do you think about that? What are your choices? So Sometimes making it a shared versus a confrontational helps. But unfortunately, there still will be those people and I, it's very hard when they just say, nope, uh, I don't wanna talk about that. You can't make me. <laughs> um, don't give up though. I mean, you know, you just kind of have to keep, like she said, keep reminding people. We have a friend that just, his wife had a massive brain tumor and passed away. Like right away, I mean, it was less than a month when they, from diagnosis to death. And um, they had all their stuff done. She even had her obituary written ahead, um, mm -hmm. but it was the most peaceful decision-making because there wasn't, they didn't have to, to make any decisions. She just said, here's my stuff. This is what I want to do. I want to go home. I don't want chemo. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and off they went. It was just boom, 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 quick, nothing to, nothing to argue about. So I don't know if your family's like mine, they're all fighters. We're all fighters. It's just a thing. And <laughs> if they're like that, this takes the fight out of it too. And I, from my perspective, I said to my mom and 
like you need to update that and we're not fighting about that at the end like you know it's been 10 years now it's time to update you've got some things so just kind of keep saying peaceful less fighting that's my my two cents on how to do it I, i'm not trying to be funny about this but i just had a conversation about this with my brother because he's in the hospital because he's got a COPD and he's got a um blood had a blood clot in his lung mm. and um I told him yesterday um uh, I said remember that uh I have control over you if you don't want to make a decision <laughs> <laughs> so he said yep I, you right <laughs> so. thank you yep so you know, I, I, outside of that, Linda, I don't know what to tell you because I lost the grandbaby today too. So last oh, night, I know. you know, it's, death is hard. It's really hard, especially mm -hmm. when you have a big family. My mom had twenty five kids, and we're down to eleven now. Um, oh and it's so hard. They don't, they don't believe in life insurance. They don't believe in talking about it, and they don't, you know. But they forget that they leave behind the burden of trying to bury them trying to make the right decisions for them right. um, and I'm just I, and I'm just done I'm just I'm just about at I'm just I don't know what else to do because we got two more just then we gave them six months to live with cancer cancer just ravaging our family and they still don't get they still don't have a clue I don't right. understand I, I just I just can't wrap my head around it right now and I know right now it's a it's a emotional burden on you because I'm even though I'm not the oldest in my family I've lost the uh, we down, it was eight of us and, and we down to five. So, um, you know, um, I know that I've been the mostly, like when she was talking about the advocate, that's been mostly me and this family. And when you take on that responsibility, that's a heavy burden. Heavy. You know, really. I, yeah, yeah, I have a sister. She, she's been happening so that, I, you know, I got everything planned out for me. You know, with my sister and my kids, they know what I need to be done, what need to be done. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna get my other sisters and brothers to do that. Y'all older than I am, you know. And they, you know, I'm 61 years old, and y'all need to get a clue. Cause I'm mm -hmm. just drained right now. I'm just like, I'm just drained. I sometimes know. Linda, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sometimes, Linda, another technique I've used is people who um, aren't aren't willing to 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 talk about this sometimes you kind of need to find someone who they respect or who they'll listen to more so sometimes if there is a parent or a doctor or um a spiritual leader or someone else who maybe you can kind of bug them and say hey could you talk to john about this i'm really worried about it and you really respect maybe you could invite him to lunch and talk about this so that has sometimes worked for those people who um choose not to talk about it is finding someone someone else that um kind of team in a, in a way team up it's a great idea jackie you had a question too well it was kind of related to the same thing about friends but not with family so much because like you you know your family and you know who would be this this one that would be able to do it but if if you're gonna think about asking a friend and I just moved to this area. So I feel like I don't have a lot of friends here that I know that well to wanna to do that with. And even my family, the only one that's here is my daughter. Um, so, you know, I, when I'm trying to find three people, I'm thinking, hmm, do I have three people that are real nearby? Because everybody else is at least three hours away. So it would be kind of hard to make plans here when they're three hours away. And then I thought about, well, friends, I don't feel like I have that many yet, <laughs> but yeah. I, I'm getting to know a lot of people through these classes, you know, at least this way and having shared ideas and values and things. So that's good. But I, I don't you know, how do you, how do you pick a person that's not family if you don't have deeper relationships with them? Sometimes distance is not necessarily an issue. So let's say I have a sister who lives in California. I can still choose her as a patient advocate many not always but a lot of these decisions can be based on the phone too or i mean look what we're doing now zoom conferences doctor uses this technique as well so um three hours away is not necessarily a barrier we have patient advocates that are um out of the area or out of the state all the time 
So that, that's okay. And I feel like you, my friend, Jackie. <laughs> I know. We're I've getting... seen you enough. I feel like we friends now. <laughs> I know. Uh, my brothers are the ones that are three hours away, and they, you know, they don't do computers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they barely do cell phones. They have some, one has a flip phone yet, and doesn't doesn't they don't tap one text. Two of them don't text, and they don't do emails. One does, but. You know, it's so, it just depends on <laughs> what their um, computer skills are. Um, yes. But that's good that you mentioned that because my sister, she's just, she just uh, an hour and a half away. So she's not that far away, but uh, if they could do things by, by phone and stuff like that. I didn't, I didn't even think of that. So thank you. I love that you think digitally first and then phone later, Jackie. That makes me so happy. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Because we're right at 11 o'clock. Uh, actually, we're a couple minutes over, but we started a couple minutes late. So I have, a, I have to leave, so I, I will see you All next right. 2 o'clock. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you. We'll see you. You got to go, go yeah. out to the period agency and, and yes. be late. You are getting some more work. You got to get some yeah. stuff today. So, yeah. all right. Well, everyone on behalf of Bronson and Area Agency on Aging and the Campus for Creative Aging, thank you so very much. <laughs>